Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, you, If you're looking for the third session for the virtual vegetable short course, you are in the right spot. We are gonna begin in just a few minutes. Um, as you're entering the Zoom room, just know that you are muted and you're not on camera. So feel free to relax, finish eating your dinner. Hopefully there are lots of vegetables on that plate and um, prepare for another great virtual short course session. And again, thank you for everyone um, who is joining the Zoom room. We're going to be starting our session in just a few minutes. Feel free to settle in. Don't worry, your, your microphone is muted and you are not on camera. Um, and if you want to get familiar with Zoom, if you want to check out the buttons at the bottom of your screen, you should see a Q&A button. That is gonna be the spot to put your questions for um, tonight for the presenters. So be sure to check that out. The chat is currently disabled, so don't worry about that. Um, but any, any and all questions you have for Peggy and Kent tonight, you'll be able to put in the Q&A box. And we will get started in just a moment. Again, for everyone who's just joining, welcome. Just a note for participants, your microphone is muted and you're not on camera, so you don't have to worry. Um, you get to watch the three of us on camera instead. Um, so feel free to settle in and we are gonna go ahead and get started. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for the third installment of the SDSU Vegetable Short Course, the virtual version. Um, this is what we hope to be an annual event. And we're so grateful for those of you who are joining us across the state, across the region. And we've had folks from as far away as Alaska joining us. So thanks for joining us from across the country. Um, the goal of the virtual short course is to empower producers to improve and expand their small and medium scale specialty crop farms. And this short course is supported by the South Dakota Department of Ag and Natural Resources um, under a grant, a specialty crop block grant that is um, doled out by the USDA. So we're really grateful for that funding. Um, we're gonna have two presenters this evening. They are each gonna give a presentation and we are gonna allow for plenty of time for questions and answers at the end of the session. So as you have questions for either Kent or Peggy, please put those in the Q&A and know that we are gonna be addressing those at the end of the session. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and give you a little background on both of our presenters this evening, and then I'm gonna turn it over to them. So we're very pleased to welcome Kent Bleger, who is a state soil health specialist with the NRCS here in South Dakota. Prior to his current position as soil health specialist, he spent the first 17 years of his career working in field offices from the Canadian border in North Dakota to his current location in here in South Dakota. So it's fair to say that Kent has seen his share of soils and production practices. And I'm really glad that Kent's able to join us tonight. And Peggy Martin is the co-owner of Cedar Creek Gardens in South Dakota, um, near, near Midland. Um, the Google address is now correct. And prior to establishing Cedar Creek Gardens, she was an IT consultant providing networking services and computer trainings across the state. Um, what started as a way to provide healthy food for her family has grown into a robust business. And it's not uncommon to see Peggy putting on several thousand miles in any given week, crisscrossing the state as she markets her produce. So um, I really look forward to tonight, tonight's discussion on soil health and Kent and Peggy, I'm gonna let you take it away. Okay, great. Thank you very much. I'm going to get kick started here and I'm going to share my screen. Okay, is that coming through? Okay, Christine. That looks great to me. Okay, fantastic. Um, so good evening, everyone. Um, thanks for the kind introduction. Uh, Christine. Um, yeah, so like she said, I'm a state soil health specialist with the Natural Resources Conservation Service. And um, what I'm going to talk about tonight is kind of more my, my after work hobby type uh, situation, I guess you could say. Um, it's become a little bit more than a hobby, but um, it's certainly a lot of fun. So um, yeah, this is a picture of, of my son holding up obviously a large eggplant. So um, 
just uh, opening up a little bit uh, tonight, we're just kind of with a, a fun fact and something to, to ruminate on and think on maybe. Um, so this is a study I ran across. I, I get sent a lot of things with my position on, on soil health and soil related issues. And um, even more as I'm doing a, doing a few more of these um, kind of smaller scale or different scale production systems throughout South Dakota, this stuff gets sent to me. So this is an interesting study that was done. Um, it's probably on something that many of us have not heard about. It certainly is nothing I'd heard about before seeing this. So there's a uh, it's an antioxidant um, called ergothionine, and the only way that humans can can get this in their diet is basically from consuming it. We can't produce it on our own, and it's consumed in um, the plant life that we eat, so our fruit and vegetables. Um, so most of us would assume that this ergothionine is produced by the plant, but the plant also does not produce it. It takes it up through its interaction with uh, the below ground for the most part, uh, mycorrhizal fungi. And so these fungi produce this um, antioxidant, the plant uptakes it, and then when we eat it, we take it into our diet, into our body. So um, the point of this study was that it, the content of the ergothionine in the plant changes um, by the type of management they do related to tillage. And so under a no-till system, it's higher, a uh, chisel disc, which would be a little less tillage. It's a little bit less than our mobile or plow. It's the, it's the lowest. So um, really what that says is someone in my world is that the less disturbance we do of the soil, um, the better off it is for soil life. So just a little tidbit of information. So now onto the kind of the meat of the, co of the conversation tonight. Um, we're gonna talk about soils. Um, I'm gonna talk a lot about soils. Um, so I'd be remiss if I, and I wouldn't be a good soil specialist if I didn't, soil specialist if I didn't talk about web soil survey. And so this is um, the online version of those old soil survey books. If you are old enough, um, or if you happen to have a copy of those old soil survey books, um, you could thumb to whatever page you wanted to, um, based on your location, you can find where your soils were on the location where you were looking at, what particular field or address. Now you can go online through Web Soil Survey. You can type in a legal description. You can type in an address. Um, you can also um, have some apps that you can use where you can just tap and it'll give you the, uh, the soil type for the lo location where you're standing right now. Um, so this happens to be a map of Peggy's place. Uh, I'm sure she recognized it right away. Um, so the important thing is that you, you go and you find the, find the location and you draw an area of interest and it will give you a map. And then you might think to yourself, well, that's great. It tells me the soil name and it even tells me the type. So for example, if you look on the upper left-hand part, it says that the LAO map unit is a Lowry Sill Loam. Okay, now to those of us in the soils world, we might know what that means, but it might give us a lot of important clues as to what that soil is. Um, but you can drill down and find a lot of information within this web soil survey. There's lots of tabs. You can tell estimated percent organic matter. It can tell the amount of potential water that the soil might hold to be available for your crops. Um, it will tell you some of the challenges for the site, uh, something that you might need to be aware of before you would start production on there. So um, I would really encourage you, especially if you're going to a new site um, to start your garden, that you would look at the soils first. Okay, the next thing is, these are the five principles of soil health. And depending on what your source is, some will say there's four principles, some will even say six, um, but these are the kind of the five that we use in South Dakota, um, especially with the Natural Resources Conservation Service. And so they're broken into two categories here, and it's, this is really the, the best way that I've found to, to remember them. The two categories are protect and feed. So the protect is in the uh, burnt orange color there, and that's keep the soil covered and minimize soil disturbance. And so it's part of my job, obviously our, our agency was started during the dirty thirties to prevent erosion. And we've gotten really good at talking about the first two principles, keeping the soil covered and minimizing soil disturbance. Um, but now we've moved beyond that into what we call the feed the soil. And this is so we can build our soils back up. This is kind of a regenerative ag movement um, that you hear a lot about um, or watch a lot of YouTube videos on. So that's plant diversity. Um, so in a, in a garden situation, that's as many 
different plants as you can get um, in a space and in some circumstances in other circumstances if you're more of a block or row um, type production it's rotating those vegetable or fruit crops as much as possible the next one is a continual living root and this is one that i really like to focus on that's basically having something growing in the soil for as long in the season as possible um, and, and peggy has a real great situation with her with her tunnels um, you can extend our growing season in South Dakota. So she has a lot of opportunity to have that living root in the soil for longer than a lot of us might have. And then the last one um, is one that's really can be difficult to integrate in a garden situation, especially depending on the municipality you may live in. Um, so for example, I'm in Huron, they do not allow <clears throat> even chickens in town. Basically it's cats and dogs and that kind of thing for pets. Um, so it's really tough to integrate livestock into a situation. And even in Peggy's situation, you don't want to necessarily have livestock in the tunnels uh, because it's there's some contamination issues that may happen and they may be eating some of the things you might not want them to eat. Um, but the way that I integrate livestock or kind of get around that is by the application of, of compost. Okay, so this is something that uh, my family and I started. This is um, associated with our with our church that we attend in here on. They have a large plot of land, many acres surrounding the, the building, a relatively new building. And it started off as uh, basically a way for myself and my family. We grew all this produce and we and we donated it. We still just about everything we grow there still is donated to low income housing that's sur all surrounding the many neighborhoods around around our church building there. And so if you're looking at this map, there's kind of a center area that kind of connects the two, like it'd be like the crossbar and an H there. That's the, the plot that my family and I maintain. Um, it's roughly 120 feet by 100 feet, give or take. Um, it's actually reduced in size as we've added more, more plots. So over the years, we've added plots for people in the surrounding community to have for free their 20, 20 foot by 20 foot plots. And they're for free as long as they maintain them, um, keep them hopefully mostly weed free and um, basically so they don't abandon them. But they're, they're free for, for people to have and each year they are all filled up. We have um, just shy of 70 plots that are available um, with some plans for expansion this year. Okay, so this is a kind of a basically just a drawing of um, typically what my garden area looks like. I've got it broken into essentially four quadrants, as you can see. And this is just kind of a typical rotation of, of what I would follow. Um, you will notice that surrounding the garden, um, I have different types of flowering shrubs, um, elderberry, plum, hedgerows, aronia berry. Um, there will be buffalo berry <laughs> planted this, this spring. Um, and the purpose of that is twofold. It's to provide pollinator habitat and for fruit production. And it's also to provide just a little bit of wind protection during those hot, dry days. And also during those uh, summer thunderstorms that we tend to get it, it will slow the wind just enough to, to prevent really serious damage, except for in the most extreme events. Um, so we've got a typical area up on the upper left is tomato, pepper, eggplant, greens, um, lots of that type of thing that grows and grows well in a row. That'll be in that area. Um, the next area to the right, uh, you'll see we have two permanent beds of asparagus and rhubarb um, that produce quite well. Um, melon, squash, pumpkins, flowers are in the next quadrant. Um, the quadrant to the lower right is a full season cover crop that is um, left to grow all year long. So that is, that's an example of something that I can do that maybe um, something, that's, something that's more in production for for profit or for sale might not be able to sacrifice a quarter of their of their land um, to basically devote it to a full season cover. Um, there might be some opportunity, uh, it just kind of depends on your situation. And I'll talk about that and show some pictures here shortly. And then the final area is the uh, area that's for sweet corn and beans. So I'm gonna show some pictures here just kind of as, as a season, a typical season evolves. And this first picture I like to show um, and if I'm in front of a live audience, especially in front of a lot of master gardeners, I'll ask them to uh, raise their hand if this picture scares them a little bit. And usually I'll get a lot of hands that will get thrown in the air. This is what my garden looks like right away in the spring. Um, this is the previous year's full season cover crop. 
you can see it produces a lot of biomass and that's exactly what I want. Um, and I'll show you what I, how I manage that here shortly. Um, so this is the previous year's area with the uh, tomatoes, eggplants, peppers, et cetera, et cetera. And you'll notice that the ground is also covered there. Um, and I use a ground, a living ground cover for my weed control and for my soil health uh, building. I do use um, a biodegradable plastic that I've had mixed success with. Um, and I believe the last week, Thursday, um, I think Jordan talked, I was, wasn't able to attend that, but I think he's used some of that maybe too. Um, so I, I think it's getting better. Uh, my first couple of goes with it, it was not fantastic, but it, it does start to break down um, some of the newer products that I've found. Okay, so this is that cover crop area and you can see it looks a little better than uh, the previous photo of it. So what I do is I take a deck mower and I make a pass over it with the blades off and I just knock it down and then I'll put the deck as high as possible. I will mow that down. Then I will lower it half again and mow it down. It creates a really nice thick mulch that's four to six inches thick and that is my ground cover and my weed control for the area that I typically plant my melons and squash and flowers in. Um, this is a photo of the previous year's sweet corn and you can see I use this is um, basically a weed fabric uh, berry that a lot of our conservation districts use to keep weeds out of their tree rows that they plant in windbreaks. And I found that to be um, pretty good. It's long lasting. The photo you see here, um, this fabric has been used for going on 13 years now. So it holds up pretty well. It does start to fray a little bit, um, but there are some, some tricks to prevent that also. Okay, so these are uh, my indentured servants or as most people call them, their children, my children. So these are the uh, free workers that I have. And this is, um, basically what our garden looks like. We spend the, the, a good chunk of a, a Saturday with cleanup, and then we'll spend another Saturday with a lot of our planting. And so it's really two kind of, can be two longer days of, of, of cleanup and moving things around and then planting. But after that, it's really uh, kind of maintenance free and you'll see what that looks like here. So this is what my, the surface of my soil looks like. Um, I didn't, what I didn't tell you is that we have really sandy soil. And so it, it's called a shoe and it's a loamy fine sand. It's, it's not quite like beach sand. It's got a little bit of a loam texture to it, but it's really sandy. Um, if you're familiar with the Forestburg area and the, the great watermelons they grow, we're just a little bit better than they are, but it's, it's still pretty sandy. So that's the kind of soil I'm dealing with. So this is what our surface looks like if you brush back that residue that's left on the surface. Okay, now I'm just going to go through a sequence here of what the garden looks like. So you're seeing the, the cover crop planted there. And how I do that is I basically just broadcast seed that with a hand spreader. And then it gets a real light layer of compost, a quarter inch maybe, um, just to cover that seed a little bit and get it started. And that's the, typically the only part of the garden that gets the compost. And so this is really my soil building area that for the next three years, it's going to get production uh, with vegetables on it. And this is um, basically that one year where I get a lot of uh, a lot of growth and a lot of fertility put back into the soil with the compost and the cover crop. Okay, this is the, the sweet corn. And I know most of you are looking at saying that doesn't look very good. And you're right, it doesn't. So this is, if you're familiar, here I had two derechos blow through this year. So um, this is kind of after two derechos. What I will tell you is that a lot of the corn did kind of break off but you can see it's starting to regrow in some of the areas. So you'll see later photos where it, it came back and did quite well. Um, so we move that fabric every year and it's basically just held in place by landscape fabric. And we'll put some other weighted things on there early on to keep the wind from flapping the fabric around. Um, okay, this is eggplants, tomatoes, peppers, et cetera. And so you can see this is the biodegradable fabric. And then between, the, between them is the, the living cover. And so what I use is an annual ryegrass and typically crimson clover. I've added a couple other clovers, um, but crimson seems to do the best for me. Um, so those are both annuals and they will typically die back with our, with our cold winters in South Dakota. But what I will do is I will broadcast that right away in the spring and then I will let it grow until it gets six, seven, eight inches tall and then I will mow it down if it's still aggressively growing. And that's, that's my weed control and my ground cover and my soil building all in one. 
go through a sequence here and watch the cover crop grow. I use quite a diverse mix and we can talk about that. I 16 species in there. Um, most of what you're seeing here later on stages are sunflowers and uh, pearl millet. And so those are my big biomass producers, but there are 16 other species in there as well. So this would be right before I would mow between the rows of the tomatoes and eggplants and peppers. And you can see it's, it does quite well. It's nice and green. This is much later into the summer. So this would be, you know, probably mid-August, give or take. Um, okay, so that's a, just a real quick synopsis of what I do. And so it's, um, there's no, I don't use any of the sides, no herbicides, pesticides, fungicides, any of that stuff. I'm not technically a certified organic, but um, pretty much all organic practice. Um, and I found really with how, how I manage and following those five principles, I really have very little need um, for, for any insecticides or any of the fungicides. Um, this is an example of the soil test. I would encourage you um, on top of looking at your soil map and finding your soil type where you are, I would encourage you to take soil tests, um, especially the first year to find out what you have. And then even after that yearly, um, I know that might seem excessive to some people, but I've never really talked to anyone or found anyone that was that regretted taking the soil test. It can tell you a lot of information. Sometimes you can address something, um, a nutrient deficiency before it starts, or it might tell you something that you need to keep an eye on as the growing season uh, progresses. So what I will show you is that on the left is the very first year of this uh, of our garden. And on the right is um, the most current test from, this would be last year's test. And I'm gonna highlight just a few things. So we'll look at the organic matter and you can see there that it's pretty low on the first year, that 1.7%. And then it's gone several percentage points higher since then. Um, I attribute a lot of that to having something growing out there as long as possible. I attribute that to the compost that we use and to the cover crop. Um, so that's where most of that can happen. So you'll talk with some soil scientists that will say you can't build organic matter that fast in, in most systems. Um, but I believe in our smaller, a little more intensively managed um, pieces of ground um, that we can, we can go quite higher um, a lot faster. And this is, this is just a little bit of proof towards that. Okay, so the next one we're going to look at is the, um, <clears throat> excuse me, the phosphorus. And so you can see it's three parts per million, which is quite low the first year. And then where we sit here this last spring, we're just shy of 19 parts per million, which is, which is rated high. Um, so keep in mind, I've never added any commercial phosphorus. It's all coming through the action of the, of the compost, which I can talk about that later on if we want to also. Um, and also from the phosphorus being released that's in the soil. And that, that release takes place by having living roots um, with mycorrhizal fungi able to access it and make it plant available. Potassium, um, another important nutrient for, for fruiting and vegetable production. Um, you can see it was quite low in the first year. And here we are at 612 parts per million. So that's another example of um, soil practices increasing that. Um, important number. And then the last thing we're talking about is pH today on, on these tests. Um, first year was 7.9, so that's a little on the high side. Um, you start to see that and you can get to, um, start to see some nutrient tie up and make a, those nutrients a little harder to access for your plant. And where we are today is kind of right at that sweet, sweet spot, that 6.8. Seven is, as most of us know, is neutral, um, but kind of that ideal for, for a lot of nutrient release in, in plants is just a little below neutral, so a little bit on the acid side, not too strong where you then start to see production issues also. So with that, we're going to transfer over to Peggy's soil test. And so I, I was fortunate enough to meet Peggy here 2019, I believe, um, shortly after I took this position. Um, and, I, and I was really fortunate. I've, I've learned quite a bit from Peggy, as, as I think you all will tonight also. Um, so We've got a similar situation. This is the test from 2019 from her um, tunnels and on the left and then on the right is the most current tests. So we'll look at the same things. We've got organic matter um, 10 and 
which is very high, and organic matter today, which is 7.9 and 8.2. And most of you might be thinking, hey, that's, that's lower, isn't that concerning? Well, these two sites had quite a bit of manure that were added prior to production. And so there's a lot of organic matter that was brought in. And some of that organic matter is breaking down and, and making nutrients available for plants. So in this, in this case, I would not consider the organic matter reduction um, as a negative. It's really just something natural that would happen, especially without any additional manure that's being added. Phosphorus, you can see very high in 2019, and it's still very high, although the numbers are coming down a little bit. Potassium, in both cases rated very high. Still, the numbers are coming down a little bit. And we've got calcium, which I didn't talk about in mine, and those numbers are quite high also. So what I would like to point out just real quickly before I transition to Peggy is that um, when you look at your soil tests, you would think that high and very high are always numbers that you want to see, especially as it relates to the major nutrients. That, that's not always the case. A great example of that is our calcium and phosphorus that we see here. Those two are antagonistic towards each other. Um, so oftentimes, if you have high calcium, you can have problems with phosphorus uptake. And on the other side of the equation, if you have high phosphorus, um, you can have trouble with calcium, um, calcium uptake. So really, if you have high one or the other, you can have problems with uh, uptake of either the phosphorus or the calcium. So sometimes very high in certain circumstances isn't always great. As long as you aren't having production issues, it's not something to worry about. But if you are having some production issues, especially if you can identify them um, uh, through what's happening with the leaf or, or production of the fruit, um, this is a good clue towards that. So with that, I'm going to transfer over to Peggy and I will stop sharing. Good evening. Thanks, Kent. Um, yeah, uh, we met, I think in 2019, right after <clears throat> we had the manure um, catastrophe in the tunnels. But uh, let me start um, screen share here. Um, So Cedar Creek Gardens is, if you've been there, you know it's in the middle of nowhere. And again, we were just going to start growing some food for our families. And so we threw a hut tunnel on the existing site. We now have eight of them. We're getting ready to put four 200 footers up this spring. So we'll have 12. And um, my business partner is a farmer, was a farmer. So we have to deal with some of that mentality. And you can see that this is one of our, it's an acre of tomatoes. And, um, you know, there's the, there's the bad and then there's the necessary evil. And he um, is, is overcoming that mentality. Oh, you know, no weeds. That's what you need. And we're going to till. And, and every time he gets a discount, we gain an acre. But anyway, um, we're, we're going to talk about some of the challenges of, of, of building soil because, what happened to us was, again, you know, you all have the, the barnyard manure pile and, and you think that's what you should go put on your field. And so Bud being a farmer, and again, I, you know, it's just one of those things that we did. We went and threw manure on. Well, we got our soil so out of whack that literally one um, soil specialist told us it was going to be 14 years to get it fixed. Um, so we have a lot of challenges um, to overcome, but we're working on it because Soil, um, building the soil is um, really important to us, especially now that we're into commercial um, production. So one of the things that is challenging it, uh, with building soil health in the commercial production side is the profit versus the soil health. And we all know that cover crops, they do these things without a doubt. And cover crops are great. Um, I, I'm not even going to try to argue that point. But Again, there's some challenges with using cover crops and specialty crop production. So one of the challenges, and this again, this is just one of our, our fields that we have, is we um, let the cover crops go, and then um, this was in 2019, and then uh, we mowed them. Since 2019, um, we've been in a drought, and we have planted cover crops every year and never have established a crop. And we've planted them after we've taken production, you know, 
out. We've um, planted them while we were in production. We're actually part of the SDSU um, research project that was last fall. And so there's just some challenges <clears throat> with trying to use covered crops in, in our area. One of them is, is, you know, the loss of production. And you're like, okay, yeah, but you, you, you have some loss of production, but you're going to have better soil. Well, in commercial production, if you think about it, uh, again, it could be a lot. So you, if you take a 100-foot row, you've got um, 50 plants because you plant them every 24 inches. you got 50 plants in a 100-foot row, and um, you're going to get – the average is 10 to 15 pounds. That's typical. We, we, because of our nutrient management program, we're getting 23 to 28 pounds. So if you take that, and again, you're getting about 1,250 pounds per 100 foot row. And even if you have a 10% reduction because the cover crops that you've planted um, are taking moisture away from your cash crop, you know, 1,250 pounds doesn't sound like much, but at $3 a pound for tomatoes, you know, and we've got 25 rows. That that can mean you know eighty two hundred dollars in our out of our pockets. If you and if you have a fifteen percent, you're at fourteen thousand dollars. So can I afford to put cover crops in? Sometimes yes, sometimes no. Um, and and again, it just comes down to moisture. You know we um, we have two wells that run twenty four seven. You know we turn one off and we turn one on, but they run from May till October twenty four seven. Um, and again, we've um, <clears throat> tried to plant some cover crops and we use a big water wheel transplanter. Planting into that terminated cover crop, um, it, we can't do it with our water wheel. And you know, when we're planting 1,200 plus um, tomatoes, um, 700 peppers, we just don't have the time to be hand planting things. Um, again, I would avoid cover crops in the same families as your cash crops. And so let's talk about, <clears throat> excuse me, that was some of the, the things that we deal with in field production. And it's even more challenging in high tunnel production. So you've got grass cover crops, and then you have the, you know, the perennial clovers, the low maintenance ones that, that you can put in between the rows, and then you have termination. Well, the part about the using the grass cover crops is, you know, it takes six weeks to get them up and going, and you don't have six weeks. We don't have we we start growing in our tunnels from in in, in um, the end of April and we don't quit till Thanksgiving and whatever is growing in Thanksgiving we just walk away because we have to have that break time because our our um, garden season this year is will start on February 10th and so we just have to have that time for breaking so again they can't come to fruition so they're not um, you know scavenging out the different nutrients also. Um, the nutrients can, you know, sometimes be tied up and, and stunt the crop because especially in the high tunnel, when you're trying to incorporate them, the, the high tunnels, you know, can be a lot drier than outside. And so you don't get that breakdown. So if you don't get them all broke down, you know, and, and get them so that the soil can utilize it, you're, you're taking away um, some of the nutrients that you should be having for your plants. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and one thing is also like if you were to plant daikon radishes, they will, because we're in zone four, they, they'll overwinter, they won't die in there. And so then you have all the, you know, the tops and the things that you're just asking for aphids. One year, because I like strawberries, we planted strawberries along the edge and they were green all winter and we had the worst aphid problem and we don't have strawberries anymore. Um, yeah, I, I was told in no uncertain terms, we're not going to have strawberries. Um, again, if you put the, you know, in between the rows, um, you, you can deal with, you know, fungal diseases because you're just retaining the extra moisture. Um, and the again, the clovers are highly susceptible to powdery mildew. This is something I just learned. And so um, Christine has the link and I, I cited the study um, that we did. And then just the termination is is how you know how are you going to terminate them in um the tunnels you know you go in there with um, a lawnmower or or whatever so again i'm for cover crops um i'm not the specialist in trying to get them integrated into our tunnels um one thing that we have found though because our tunnels are plastic from wall to wall is that <clears throat> when we walk away in november 
we don't pull the plastic. We leave that in there. We'll clean out the tomatoes and the peppers, but our kale tunnel, which is what you saw here, this is a picture of our kale tunnel. We leave that foliage in there and, and then we walk away and then we come back and our soil is a lot more mellow than when we just yanked all the plastic out, got them cleaned up and then we moved on. Um, so some things that, again, you have to think about the cover crops, you know, we call them spring cash flow crops. You're getting your lettuce in, your Napa cabbage, your bok choy, those things, get them out and then get some cover crop put in there. Um, if you're out in field production and then um, you can come back in with, you know, your late broccoli, your late cabbage. Um, you can again come in with maybe a fall planting a spinach or lettuce. So just some, some things to think about. Um, oh, that, I, sorry, I, that was our onion crop uh, last year. And so um, again, onions are one of those things that we'll be putting out in uh, about the, uh, about the 15th of April. And then we'll have those, you know, cause we want to have them for July markets. Um, so that's how come we put them in so early and we don't use the bulbs, we use the sets. So again, we'll, and then when, when we have the um, storage onions, they'll be even in longer. So, you know, end of, end of September 1st of, or end of August, 1st of September. So what are some solutions? Again, you can just revamp your bed timing, you know, plant an early season crop with a late season crop. Um, remove the ground um, from production like Kent does. That's an awesome thing. Unfortunately, you know, some people just don't have that available. You know, you can't rotate. And, and ours originally was set up to do that. We had four acres and we were going to leave one follow every year and, you know, put the ground or put the uh, cover crop in it. And um, it was, it was um, a challenge because of our irrigation system to do that. But um, we're hoping to be able to do again this year. We got some hail early on. So we had two extra acres um, because we took them out of production because they're, it was just too late in the season. And we went in there and planted cover crop. And because of our drought, um, that was in um, June, we planted cover crop. It never came up, Not it didn't even come up. So that ground just laid there, um, you know, pretty much barren all summer, except for some die hard weeds. Um, the high tunnel options, again, you know, there's just lots of things that you can, you can um, move your rows over, you know, and, or, or um, we don't, and also one thing that we do in our, our tunnels now is we only um, amend and um, lightly till the amendments in. And when I say till, it's more like of a raking type than a, you know, like a, um, a tiller. Um, we don't, we don't incorporate the soil where our walkways are. We don't add that because that soil gets so hard and so compacted. It, it was really bringing, bringing our soils, um, the quality of our soils down. So again, we only do it where the beds are. Um, oh, so here's one thing that if you own high tunnels, um, we go in there and we flood them. One of, one of the problems about high tunnels is there's no leaching of the soil. So you get a lot of salt buildup. So every couple of years we'll go in there and we will just turn the sprinklers on and we'll run them, you know, day and night. And so for every six inches of water that you um, add, you're going to get a 50% reduction in, in your salt buildup, 12 inches, 80% and 24 inches. And so you'll get 90 and, and literally we, we go tell, we run them as long as we can. And you can think up, you know, way past your ankles. Um, so you hope that you can get to the sprinkler before you're stuck in the mud. But this is one thing that has really helped our, our salt levels. This, this um, slide, honestly, I just popped this in there today because there was a big conversation and I just came from AgFest last night and um, there was a lot of conversation about composting and manure. And there is a difference. Um, <clears throat> first of all, compost is made up of a lot of vegetation. Manure is animal poo with maybe some bedding mixed in. So when you're, when you're talking about compost and manure, sometimes those things get interchanged, but there really are two different things. And I would tell you, soil test before you do either of these. We didn't you know, back in 18, when we threw the manure in there, 
<clears throat> we weren't soil testing at the time. Our production went so far down in 19, we were like, what happened? And so um, that's when we got the soil test and we got, of course, we didn't know how to read them. So we got all the can and said, could you explain this in like language we can understand? And we're better at it now. So compost, again, the, the nutrients might not be readily available for the plant uptake, you know, and, and typically they can be low in phosphorus, the compost that you're adding. Um, that's about how much you need if it's a new bed, if it's an established bed. Again, that's about what you would want to put on. Um, the con, the manure side, um, it can be, you can develop high concentrates of nutrients. You saw how some of our levels were so whacked out. So it ties up, you know, our phosphorus and our calcium, they're, they're, they're always feuding. And we have one tunnel that we're finally just going to take out of tomato production because we're tired of fighting it because our, our nutrients are just bound up in it. Um, be careful about herbicide, whether you're composting or manuring. Don't, you know, we don't, when we make our compost, we don't put our tomato plants in because if there's any disease in there, it's one of the things that we just don't want to have to deal with. So be careful. Um, and then I definitely, you know, because of the high salt in the manure, um, be careful about adding it to a tunnel that already can have salt issues. And then they actually make, it's, it's, it's coop poop. I, I think that's the name of it, coop poop. Anyway, um, it's an OMRI approved, um, it's an OMRI approved um, type of, of chicken pellets that you can put in and get. One of the things <clears throat> that's kind of unique to Cedar Creek Gardens is that we use molasses. Um, we sung them, some of the on this by accident, but we use a lot of it. We foiler feed it, we put it into our ground. Um, it improves the microorganisms. It Im improves soil aggregation and reduces the crusting. Um, there's some side benefits. Um, it, we don't see the nematodes. We can plant tomato after tomato after tomato. We have, to, we have some of our tunnels that have had tomatoes in them for five years and we don't have issues with some of the, the diseases. And so <clears throat> those are a couple um, urals I think that um, Christine was going to post some of those in the chat. And those are actually the study. The one was done with spinach and the other was done in Hawaii. And they actually did find the results on the, on the tomatoes themselves. And that was the one that was the, the um, nematoids in the tomatoes was in a reduction because of the, of the molasses that they used. And again, all I can say is reduce tillage. Till more products are awesome for minimum till. You know, you don't need to get the tiller out and go six, 12 inches deep. I wouldn't recommend it. You just, you're just destroying things left and right. So that's all I have. Um, I guess, Christine, I'll stop sharing and we have time for some questions. Awesome. We are going to have plenty of time for questions tonight, folks. So anything you were curious about for Kent or Peggy, please continue to drop that in the Q&A. And... Um, Shameless self-promotion, if folks, before you leave tonight, if you would be willing to fill out the session three survey, I would certainly appreciate it. I totally forgot to introduce myself tonight, so um, you already have probably deduced the fact that I'm Christine Lang, but I'm an assistant professor and extension specialist, so the survey that you give on these sessions helps us design future programming, and we do read those results and take all of that into consideration. So. Um, please make sure you grab that survey link for tonight's session before you depart and stick around. We are going to have all sorts of questions. So Kent, I'm going to start with you and we're going to kind of then transition to Peggy. But Kent, when you showed that picture of your garden overwintering and all that cover crop biomass, what were the cover crops that had overwintered that we saw in that mix? Okay, yeah, so I, uh, I wrote those down quick. Uh, this is the ones I can do by memory, and I can, I can get the cover crop sheet I use out to you, Chris, at some point. Um, so I've got uh, pearl millet, oats, annual ryegrass, uh, cereal rye or winter rye, uh, crimson clover, bursine clover, sun hemp, cow pea, mustard, sunflower, buckwheat, peas, radish, and flax. Um, I might be missing one or two, um, but uh, the purpose of that is diversity. And really what it does is there's all, all four 
basically all four crop types within there. So you have a warm season grass, you have cool season grasses, uh, <clears throat> warm season broadleafs, and then the cool season broadleafs. And so what happens is when I when we broadcast that early in the spring, it kind of goes through a succession of what's growing and what's fading away. And the end result is all that biomass you see with mostly the pearl millet. Um, but there's, like I said, there's 15, 16 species within there. Um, you'll know, you probably have noticed there was lots of um, legume plants in there. So the two clovers are obviously uh, legumes. The sun hemp is a legume, that's a tropical legume. Um, cow pea is another one that does really well that's hot and dry. Um, can't remember, oh, and then I've got peas in there. So peas that up the obviously legume. So those are my kind of my nitrogen builders and everything else uh, has, its, has its purpose too. So it's, it's a very diverse mix. I don't, you don't, you may not need that in your, in your situation. Um, but for me, it's kind of one that I've settled on. I kind of trial and error over years. And I've been using this mix for probably the past five or six years. And I really like it. So. Awesome. So Ken, a follow-up question to that. So you have a diverse list of cover crops that you use. Are you getting that pre-mixed? Are you mixing it yourself? Could you give folks some hints on where to source cover crop seeds, especially for our South Dakota listeners? Yes, certainly. So um, this will speak mostly to our South Dakota listeners, but it probably would apply to, to other states also. Um, so I do have mine pre-mixed. Um, I get mine from a, um, a seed company out of, out of Brookings, uh, Millborn Seeds. Um, but you can get just about anyone that sells cover crop seed will do these mixes for you. And what I typically do is I'll usually buy a 20 pound bag and that will usually last me three years. <laughs> Keep in mind, I'm, I'm not doing a large scale, um, but it's the, the initial price might, if you're a smaller scale person, you say, eh, that's a little spendy, but it, that seed will last you three years. Um, they, a lot of seed companies don't wanna do much smaller than 20 pounds because the mixing is not necessarily worth it for them to, to handle that. Um, but you can get them from a lot of conservation districts. Um, and there's one in each county in South Dakota. A lot of them handle um, cover crop seed for various seed companies. So you can, those would be a local contact. Um, or if you have a local egg co-op, they'll often be able to get a hold of that seed for you also. There's lots of sources. Um, you just really just, just start calling around. You probably won't have problems finding it. Awesome, thank you. So we had someone who was curious about um, your cation exchange ratio in your soil Kent, and then they had a follow-up um, or what is the normal CEC rate for a clay soil? Um, would we bring in composted manure and cover crops to raise the CEC? Do you recommend other amendments? So Kent, I'm gonna okay, put that so, one your way. <laughs> yeah, so the I didn't show that part of my soil test. I believe it was on Peggy's. Um, I remember I think the the manured portion, those manured tunnels had a CEC in the 20s, mid to upper 20s from Peggy's, if I remember correctly. Um, and then the other soils that didn't have all the manure from Peggy's operation, I think were in the teens. And so that would be pretty typical for a loam soil, which is what Peggy, Peggy has. Um, clay soils, um, I, I don't wanna get too soil nerd on everyone here, but the clay soils are gonna have a much higher CEC. And the reason behind that is they have more exchange sites. Uh, there's a lot of surface area on clay particles, even though they're, they're microscopic. And so that's kind of just a real layman's definition. Um, I wouldn't give you necessarily typical CECs because that's gonna be all over the board. Um, Peggy's loam soils are gonna be different than the loam soils that I would have here and here on. Um, sandy soils, which I'm operating in, almost always have the lowest CECs because they have the lowest amount of exchange sites the sand particles are large and just don't hold a lot. Um, so that is really my challenge. Um, you can increase cation exchange capacity with, with organic matter. Um, organic matter holds, they have a lot of exchange sites also. So organic matter, it, I know it, people probably get sick of hearing it in the, in the garden and the production agriculture world, but it really does help to rectify a lot of issues. Um, and low CEC would be, be an example of that. Okay, we're gonna go with another um, 
kind of soil water nerd question for you, Kent. Um, not that you're a soil or a water nerd. We're very glad you're here. <laughs> so, well, yes, have, water now. <laughs> <laughs> have you ever tested the pH of your water source? Um, someone is asking from Pennington County, their well water has a pH of 7.5 and I struggle to lower my pH in my bed. So any comments on water and soil and how you deal with that? Yeah, so our my water source is city water, so we're paying for it. So that's one of the reasons that we have to be very efficient and so health oriented with our garden. It's we're paying for water if we have to water. Um, so the, the city of Huron's the water source and most of the water sources throughout South Dakota are gonna be a little bit on the basic side. So they're gonna be in that seven range, seven, between seven and eight. Um, that's even with the municipal water, especially um, uh, West River, was that correct? It was from Pennington County. Yep. Yeah. So if you're well water, you're almost certainly gonna have something that's higher pH. So in the mid sevens. Um, you know, typically I'm not necessarily concerned with with the water source unless you are throwing a lot of water down. Um, and I know that can be the case in some circumstances, but really to change the pH of the of the soil is not easy. There's a lot of a lot of buffering that takes place, and um, the only way you can kind of start to reverse that and go in the other direction, especially in soils that are inherently basic um, or above seven in pH. Um, is to really, you'd have to throw a lot of, if you're going to drop them, you'd have to throw a lot of water that has a lower pH into it. And then on the other side of the equation, you have a higher pH um, water, it's going to be tougher to raise it. Um, that being said, if you have been guarding in the same spot for a long time and you are Western South Dakota with the lower natural rainfall amount, you're probably water, watering over a longer period. The, what I would tell you is that um, rule of thumb with watering is always to water deep and not as often. That will help you if you are starting to have those issues. Um, the deeper, what I mean by deep is put enough down so it's going lower in the profile. It's better to throw uh, an inch on a week as opposed to a quarter inch a day. I know we can be tempted to do that to give that constant feeding, but um, typically if you have a pH that's 7.5 with your well water, I don't I wouldn't really be that concerned about it because it, at the most, it's only going to raise your pH up to 7.5 if you're below that. So, All right. So we had a few questions about soil testing. So first, a clarification from the SDSU side. Um, someone had asked about soil testing through SDSU. It is correct. South Dakota State no longer processes publicly submitted soil samples. But we do have a list on our website of both private and public labs that you can send those samples to. So North Dakota State, University of Minnesota, and a whole list of private labs that are in state, many of which Kent and Peggy have probably worked with. So Kent or Peggy, um, how do you take a soil sample? When should you take it? What's the average cost based on your experiences? Maybe you kind of want to co-answer that one. <laughs> We take our soil samples in the spring and um, it's about $65 because we get a little bit, we get a recommendation of what we should do um, from Midwest soil as to, you know, what amendments we should be adding, but we, we take them in the spring. And an additional yep. question, how deep should we be sampling? <laughs> You want me to take that, Peggy, or you want to? Yep, go ahead. Okay, I'll take it. So uh, traditionally, it's zero to six inches. And that's what a lot of publications, studies, extension groups will say. Um, and for the most part, that'll give you the information you need. Um, what I will tell you is I, I prefer two sets of samples. And I know this is probably above and beyond for a lot of people. But uh, I think we all know that our roots of our plants go much deeper than six inches. And so there's a lot of nutrients to be gained and acquired from deeper in the profile. I like to see zero to six and six to 24. Zero to six yearly, six to 24, maybe every other year, every third year, since it's not gonna change as rapidly. Um, I also agree with Peggy, in, in the spring in South Dakota, you wanna typically test as close to planting as possible. All right, so, 
We've had some questions about cover crops for specific situations. So again, um, Kent or Peggy, if you want to weigh in on this, any recommendations for cover crops to put in raised beds to help improve the soil after growing for several years? So raised beds versus in-ground systems. Yes, I, I recently talked with uh, South Gordon here probably in the past couple of weeks with a question that was exactly this and raised beds for cover crops. I, what I'll tell you is I, I think it's, it's a little bit trickier to do in raised bed situation. You know, a lot of things are easier in raised beds, uh, ease of access and harvest and planting and all that stuff and even watering can be. Um, but cover crop situation, I think you, you really need to be probably careful with your species selection and depending on when you're going to plant it. Um, I would tend to go towards something that's maybe not as tall in stature, like I'm planting six foot, seven foot tall pro millet. That probably doesn't fit that scenario, but you can still plant other things that would do the same job. Um, if you were to test maybe the soil within your raised bed, it's low in nitrogen, lean more towards legumes. Um, probably the cool season grasses, which would be annual ryegrass, even um, even the wheat species, spring wheat, winter wheat, um, cereal rye might be options to look at. All right, so this is another one. And Peggy, if you have some production experiences with bindweed, I look forward to your feedback on this one. Um, so ideas for controlling bindweed and specifically, um, someone is curious, do you have any recommendations of allelopathic cover crops to try to subdue that field bindweed or any other control measures? Maybe we'll just talk about how do you control bindweed? Ken, are there any cover crops you'd recommend? <laughs> Um, yeah, I'll tackle it and I'll transfer over to Peggy. I'm not going to talk too much on it. Um, bindweed is, is a tough one. Um, it's, a per, it's a perennial. It's very deep rooted. It's multi-branched. Um, you, you pull one plant, you think you got it, and all you do is make it angry and it's going to send up more from its, from its roots. Um, I'll tell you, is most, of the, most of the allelopathic uh, plants that we're planting in cover crop mixes, um, uh, cereal rye is the greatest example and probably the best one. It is allelopathic primarily for, um, the allelopathy prevents the germination of that weed seed. So it doesn't necessarily prevent a plant from growing if it's already growing, which in a perennial like a bindweed, probably not going to. But the bindweed, bindweed is actually not that competitive. I want to know that someone's probably laughing at me right now, but if you have a lot of other plants growing there, it can get out competed. And that's basically how you weaken the plant and over time, eventually, hopefully it dies out if you keep essentially pestering it enough. Um, I guess, yeah, Peggy, you probably got other experiences with it. And I agree with Kent, it, you know, choke it out. I, I mean, and just pray you never get it. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, it's just awful, but, but yeah, you know, the density of the cover crop will help, will help reduce that. And the worst thing, I just want to remind folks that the worst thing you can do to bindweed is till it because all you're doing is chopping it into itty bitty pieces and making a whole army of field bindweeds. So don't run a tiller over it without pulling up as many bits and pieces as you can first. Um, that will definitely make it angry. Um, so another question about cover crop applications. For folks in South Dakota that have heavy clay soils, you know, heavy clay, maybe they're dealing with some compaction, poor drainage. Kent, what kind of cover crops would you recommend for those folks? Um, anything that you can get growing. That's the, that's my caveat answer. But um, so the, especially if you have the compaction in there, which can happen with clay soils, depending how they're managed prior or, or right now. Um, the way to get rid of compaction is through living roots. Um, sometimes that can be hard on these clay soils to get something established. Um, so it's, it's circumstances like that where I, I actually am fine with some amendments like the um, like a compost or really aged manure just to get something started even at that, at that seed depth. Um, and also it just adds a little bit of organic matter that hopefully works its way down through um, through worm activity and that kind of thing. Um, a lot of people will, will tend to think that you want to put large roots like radishes in there to punch through that compaction layer. Um, there's, there's something to that, but the, the, 
the other way to think about it and really the primary way, and this is what we're, we've learned this a lot from larger scale producers that do cover crops on many hundreds of acres, is that actually the fine broad, branched cover crops, the smaller rooted ones, the ones with fine root hairs like the grasses, are the ones that really get through that compaction best because they can find their way through all the little cracks and expand a little bit in there. Um, so the, the grass type ones are probably the, where I would start with a few, with a small percentage of the large rooted ones like the, the radish or the mustard or rapeseed. Awesome, thank you. So I'd say this is a question for both of you. Um, what do you each use for compost and how are you ensuring it's safe and free from herbicide residues? Our compost is, is we have 400 free range chickens. So we use that as a base. And then any ugly vegetables get thrown in there. Um, so, and then in the fall, you know, if we have any extra pumpkins, they get thrown in there if they aren't fed to the chickens. Um, so it's a combination of ugly produce and the chicken, you know, when we clean out the chicken house. And, um, and, and I would really, really encourage you that if you're going to a landfill or anything like that to get compost or manure, just, just know the source of it. Um, I can't produce enough to even for my, my relatively small area, I can't produce enough for my needs. Um, I can produce a small percentage of it and, that, and we do that. It's basically just a, kind of a lazy man's compost. It's just thrown into a pile and turned when I remember to turn it. Um, but the, the bulk of what I use is actually the, the city of Huron produces compost. A lot of our larger municipal, municipalities in South Dakota are starting to produce compost. I'm fortunate that Huron's been doing it for a long time. They're one of the first. And so theirs is really good quality and they'll, they will give you the full report. Um, I don't have a copy, I wish I had a, neglected to have that here, but um, they will produce the whole report and they will give that to you when you go there to, to load it up for yourself or have them load it. Um, and so it's whatever whatever pile um, you're pulling from is the most recent, that's the one with the most recent test. Um, so I, theirs is really good quality and they've got a really good mixing. They do a good job of measuring temperature. And um, the, the only thing that I've had um, me on the high side with theirs is um, there was a couple of years where they had some, some higher metals in them. I don't remember which ones they were. Um, they, they figured out what the source was and they have eliminated that source. Um, but I haven't really had any issues. They, they test for all or a majority of the most popular herbicides. Um, and all the only one that will ever show up, and it's usually in a mis, really minuscule amount, way below testing standards, um, is 2,4-D. Um, all the other ones are nil. There's nothing reported. Um, but occasionally, the 2,4-D will be at a very, very low percentage part per million. Um, I've never had any production issues, but um, it, it's something that if you're pulling from a municip municipality, uh, municipality, excuse me, you're going to want to probably ask for that test. Awesome. That's really good advice. Thank you, Kent. So, Peggy, to your point about using the chicken manure as a fertility source, um, two different people have asked essentially the question about, you know, food safety. How long are you having to wait before you're using that chicken manure in your vegetable, you know, production areas or how are you managing food safety around that? Um, we wait two years again, cause you're not supposed to use any manure 180 days um, according to the Food Safety Management Act. Um, and that's another reason that we used to run our, our chickens in the tunnels in the winter time. And we don't do that anymore because it, it just, you know, we don't have enough time to, to um, allow. So yeah, we, we do it for two years. And it, it's, it's like black dirt. I mean, it, that's how you can tell you have, it's fully composted and ready to go. It just, it just looks like black dirt. Yeah, and that's a really good point that compost when it's done and finished should not be sopping wet. It should not be smelly. It should not still have large bits of food particle or plant material, it should look like soil <laughs> or look like really nice kind of fluffy soil texture. So that's a really good point. So Peggy, um, the Q&A board lit up like a Christmas tree when you started to talk about molasses. So people want to know 
more about how you apply molasses? Does it make your plants sticky? Does it attract insects? Um, just share all the details on the molasses application. <laughs> so I'll tell you how we got into molasses. Um, and my business partner always says, you've been Googling, I know it's gonna mean work for me. And so I was on a search for chicken fodder, got down a rabbit hole, ended up on a German YouTube channel, had to get it translated. And all that I could figure out was they were using molasses. And I'm like, I told Bud, I said, I don't really know what this means, but they were all excited about it. And he said, well, if you can find molasses, do whatever you need to do it. Well, he didn't think I was gonna find molasses. Well, I did. I found some black strap molasses and it needs to be black strap. And um, I found it at a colony and it was thicker than sludge. And so I brought it back in a five gallon jug and said, there's your molasses. And he's like, not happy. So we had to strain the molasses and, um, but he agreed to try it, but very good about trying new things. Um, so we typically go out, you know, every two, three days and we look at everything so that I know what's coming up. So I know what's marketable because that's one of my jobs. And I was like, why are these tomato plants different? And like in the middle of the, you know, acre and I'm like, what and so i'm looking on my phone to see if we'd done a trial there i mean there was like a foot different and darker green than you can imagine and he starts laughing he says well i wasn't going to tell you but i was spoiler feeding that molasses that you maybe do and i forgot what row i was on so i just come back and i double sprayed them and the rest of the garden never caught up with those that row that we double fed molasses so he was sold on it so what we do is um, we foiler feed it and sometimes we'll just spray the ground. And, it, and if you're wondering why molasses works, this is the simplest um, explanation I can come up with is when you make bread, you have to feed the yeast sugar. And so it's a food source, a, a, you know, an instant energy burst. And so when we foiler feed it, I, I mean, you can physically tell the difference. We've had some peppers that, you know, have gone through uh, a hailstorm, and we'll go out there and we'll, um, and, and and again, you know, it doesn't have to be peppers. Our zucchini last year looked like you'd taken a weed whacker to them, and we were going to pull them, and we so, but we just clipped off all of the, um, the you know, rotten, pro, the leaves that were busted up, and we sprayed them with molasses, and we ended up having a bumper crop of. Of zucchini so how much um it's about a fourth of a cup per gallon when we foil or feed it when we when we um you know just spray the ground with it um it's a it's a it's a glug that's a bud will tell you it's a glug in his um you know in his backpack sprayer so which is four gallons so it's a you know glug so i'd say it's a probably a cup um so it's a little heavier when we spray it on the ground than when we do but don't spray um, spaghetti squash. Spaghetti squash, it'll look just like you put acid on your leaves. Spaghetti, it works on your cucumbers, your tomatoes, but we have found that it, for whatever reason, spaghetti squash hates it. But I, we're sold on it. I mean, we've been using it for, for over um, probably about eight years. Awesome. Thank you. And Peggy, and I, I have been kicking around doing some more trials with molasses so we can get some some updated South Dakota data to share with all of you. So stay tuned. Um, and if folks are interested in molasses research, would love to hear about it because I think we've got a lot of motivation through Peggy, but it'd be nice to do some rate rate trials. We need to quantify that glove, don't we, Peggy? Yeah, we do. <laughs> so um, Peggy, another question for you. How are you, are you starting your tomato and pepper plants from seed? Are you purchasing them? Are you growing the transplants yourself? How are you managing um, your warm, warm season crops? We start everything from seed. Um, except for our watermelon transplants, because all of the grow melon growers in South Dakota, you know, up by Moonsocket, we get them all in together. But um, we start everything in it. We have a potting shed, and it's just, um, I don't know, it's maybe eight by 10, but it's just wall to wall shelves with grow lights. And so we'll start those. And we I started them in a 512 um, count tray, and then I'll transplant them up to our six pack. But yes, we start everything because um, we just want to know what goes in it. You know, we don't want to make, we want to make sure that they haven't used any growth retardants, which some of the larger box stores do so that they don't get that bolting. 
but the key is um, the grow lights and keeping, you know, when you're first starting out, they're only about this far off of your plant. And then as your plant grows, you keep raising your grow light. So ours are on chains. But yeah, and we made a simple vacuum seeder, you know, a $50 vacuum seeder out of uh, literally a vacuum and some seed trays. So it goes really fast. Awesome. So I've had some questions pop up during both of your presentations about how are you controlling animal issues? I think people are curious, Kent, in your system, if you're getting a lot of animals that are overwintering in that um, cover crop residue. And Peggy, you know, are you dealing with any animal issues both in the field or getting under that fabric in the tunnel? I will start, yeah. In the tunnels, um, we, we did. That's how we got in the chicken business. We, we had a bowl infestation, so we got chickens so that they eradicate the bowls and it worked. And, um, but we, um, now we use, because again, we don't wanna put anything nasty. We built these um, PVC. They're basically a, a T um, and we just took chunks of PVC and then we, um, put the bait inside that PVC so that the critters go in there and, and we and that's we don't have any problems. I mean, but before we did that, we used, you know, you know, because you can't throw moth balls underneath the, I mean, somebody told us to do that and they told us chewing gum and I don't know, just all kinds of things. But yeah. And out in the in the field production, we will have um, critters, whether it be skunks or whatever, bite our tea tape. And so that, and that's just, you know, we have paw traps out for that. So I, I don't typically have many issues with, with animal pests, uh, to, to be honest, deer are my worst ones, um, but there's you know, nothing I can do about them. They're gonna get in there no matter what. Um, um, the, the, the majority of the, the other the other pests that I would have occasionally is basically just field mice. Um, but I don't have too much of an issue with them really consuming any of my any of my thing anything that I'm growing for production. Um, I used to do above ground potatoes, so see potatoes right in the ground covered by old alfalfa hay. Um, uh, I stopped doing that essentially because it well, the, the practice works well and they're e easy to harvest. It seems like one one year out of three mice will get in there and just live in there and take your potatoes. Um, so other than deer, mice will be my, my biggest pest. Um, I don't have much for insects. I do have um, perennial whole big family of garter snakes that live in my garden, but they are my friends. So um, they they like to be under that black fabric and they like the heavy residue. And we have lots of them. So if you're not a fan of snakes, you should probably stay out of my garden. I'm and really I'm glad you, I'm well, so glad you said that now after I visited your garden tent. I would have thought twice about visiting if I would have known about the snake situation. <laughs> and I, I will contribute to that. That's one of the reasons that we don't use straw as mulch because we have rattlesnakes. And I mean we, we kill on, and so at the end of our high tunnels, we have put mesh netting and all of our high tunnels have either window screen or some kind of mesh netting because we on average um, have to eradicate about five rattlesnakes out of our tunnels because they're trying to call in there. And once they get under that plastic, um, yeah, it, it's a bad deal. I also tread lightly at Peggy's. If folks can't tell, I'm scared of snakes, but they are really good predators. So keep them around if you can, um, but be safe. <laughs> um, so I just want to share, we had one person comment, and I, I'm curious, Kent or Peggy, if you've had any experience in this, but someone keeps pet rabbits, if I'm understanding this correctly, and they're actually moving the rabbit cage around their soil in their yard in the winter and using that as a fertility source, but they're curious if they're gonna get any urea buildup. And Kent, I don't know if you can comment on that. I know I've heard that rabbits can be a great fertility source for manure. Yeah, so, so the manure rabbits are, are, are interesting. So their manure is really, so I don't know if you're, so rabbits basically recycle their own manure once. 
So the stuff that comes out once, they can potentially go back and re-eat if times are tough. Um, so it's interesting. It's really, it's like really super broken down dry matter. Um, and it's not super, I know this is probably a better term for this, but I always call it, it's not really hot manure. So like poultry manure can be really hot. So, uh, pig manure can be really hot. What I mean by that is you can burn your plants because it's so high in fertility and salt potentially. Rabbits really aren't going to have that problem. I wouldn't be wouldn't be scared to use that as my manure fertility source. I don't know. I don't know beyond that if there's some other issues. I just don't have much experience in that realm. That realm, I guess. Lee, have you ever used rabbit manure on your farm? <laughs> no. I, I, I would just say if you're going for commercial production, though, you followed that FISMA rule, 180 yeah. days of any, I mean, the FISMA rule technically says that if you find deer poo, you have to, um, you know, not harvest within five feet of it. Well, uh, yeah, that's, I mean, that's the FISMA rule. Yeah. Yeah. And to clarify for folks, FISMA is Food Safety Modernization Act, and that applies to commercial producers that are selling above a certain dollar threshold. And there's kind of a a stair step based on how much you're selling. And if you have any questions about FISMA or food safety, my co-host Rhoda, Rhoda Burroughs, who's on with me most nights, um, Rhoda Burroughs from South Dakota State would be a great person to contact with your food safety questions. All right, um, I think this is a great one that we should talk about. So what do you recommend for starting a new garden or starting a new field without tilling? Cover crops or cover with plastic or what would be some methods to get started if we wanna right off the bat not use tillage? The tarping is great. I mean, that's just a, um, a great way to eradicate the weeds. And matter of fact, um, Christine, we're going, isn't it this spring that we're going to do the, the study the, about the tarping that you have going on? Yep, we have a new study that's gonna be looking at um, length of time to tarp soils for spring weed suppression. And we have a graduate student, we'll be working with multiple grower collaborators across the state. Um, and we're gonna look at a difficult to weed crop like onion because we really hate our lives and wanna spend a lot of time weeding if this goes <laughs> sideways. <laughs> um, but we're going to be looking at using black tarps, white tarps, as well as clear tarps compared to bare ground conditions. Yep. I don't have much to add. That's basically what I used. Um, I, was, I was basically the, the occultation was the shading amount. And so I used dark tarp or really heavy mulch. That's mm -hmm what I've used. Um, I've never I've never used the clear to, to solarize, although I've heard that's it's a faster process if you're if you don't have a year to shade things out for perennial. So. Yeah. All right, Peggy, um, folks are wondering if you can elaborate on how you use a T-pipe for vol control. Um. <laughs> so so we have a, a chunk of PVC. I'll see if I can back it. We have a chunk of PVC that's about 12 inches. And then we put that into a T, um, a PVC T, and then we put two other pieces coming out from that T. And then we put a cap on it, but we put a ready rod down through the center of it with a little wing nut. And so you pull the um, cap off and then the ready rod is there and you, and you put the bait cubes on with the holes on that ready rod and then you put the wing nut on to hold it, and then you put it inside that PVC tube. And and so then and so then because you have this tunnel, you know the mice and the and the voles like to to go into dark places, so they go in there. And then right in the center is that bait cube, and they just chomp on it, and away they go. But but then again, you're not getting nasty chemicals anywhere and then they are very efficient i mean we have them one we have one on each end of the greenhouse we've got them um in the barns the livestock barns um best thing that i i don't again it was probably something i googled <laughs> i don't know where we got the idea but um they're, they're very efficient awesome well thank you for um describing that further because i now have a really good visual too so um Peggy, we have a question about high tunnels. And I, if you will humor me for a minute, I just wanna let people know if you're on this call and you grow in a high tunnel, 
We have a 10 minute survey. Um, SDSU and NDSU are working together to understand what some of your high tunnel challenges are. Um, so I'm gonna drop that in the link or in the chat if you'd be willing to fill that out. And Peggy, people wanna know how you are getting your high tunnels to stand strong in South Dakota prairie winds. So if you'd maybe elaborate on how you secure your high tunnels a little bit and Kent, if you wanna share any tips and tricks you've seen, that'd be great too. <laughs> so we have um, high tunnels and we have cat tunnels. The cat tunnels are the ones that are 16 foot wide, um, 10 foot tall, and ours are 200 foot long and we get them from farmer's friends. So on our cat tunnels, we took um, two inch pipe. There's just some scrap pipe from out back and we drove that into the ground. And so we have the pipe on the ends. And then we also got the, the wind bracing with our kit, but on our, and, and we don't have, have any extra, you know, um, purling bracing or anything. We just have the regular on there, but the key is, is to put those those posts at the end because you don't get that sway that sways your and, and moves and then your plastic and then throw away every rope that you have don't don't put no ropes use mule tape so that um it holds your plastics more secure and um it won't break on you that's what we have and then on the sides of our high tunnels we use backpack strapping um so that uh again the plastic can't you know, come off and get caught in the wind and, and just bend it up. And then um, we have at the end of our high tunnels, we either have telephone poles or um, four by fours. Um, it, you know, I, I, again, the telephone poles were what we had at the time. I, I, if you're organic, don't, don't go that route. Um, but the four by fours, we put them at the end and then we went in there and put, um, we put it in there and put some bracing. So we, and uh, so the, you know, we, and we have the Quonset style. So they come across, we went in there and put um, top rail chain link from one side to the other. And then we took some smaller ones. And we went from the roof down to that bracing. So we have a W. I'll see if I can find a picture quickly off of one of our Facebook pages for you. Um, but that's the key. And, and, and we've, we haven't lost some um, tunnels um, due to the wind. Um, we, uh, we've been fortunate, knock on wood. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and using that backpack strapping to, to hold your sidewalls as they're rolling up and down um, is a strategy I adopted after seeing it at Peggy's farm. And we finished recovering a much smaller high tunnel at our Southeast farm in Beersford, South Dakota. We finished recovering it and securing it um, the day before the May 12th derecho. And miraculously, it did withstand the derecho. And again, it was a little smaller, so it caught a little less wind from a height perspective. But um, having, having that plastic pulled tight and having things secured did make a difference. But I also fully acknowledge that many people lost high tunnels in the derecho and it is hard to build high tunnels that stand up to derechos. But Peggy is a good example of how we can modify high tunnels to get them to stand up to normal-ish conditions. <laughs> so I shared on my screen here, um, you can see right up at the top what I'm talking about. So we go from on each bow, we go straight across. And um, let me see, what's there? Oh, now what I do? Oh. Golly, sorry. <laughs> so we go straight across and then we come down from the top of the bow down and every one of our high tunnels. And also we double poly uh, on, our, on our high tunnels, not our cat tunnels. And then we double wiggle wire um, the, 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 the roll up sides here. We double wiggle wire that. And so far so good. And that double poly, typically there's an inflation fan, so it's keeping that plastic nice and taut, which prevents it from getting caught in the wind, because once you start to do this action with the plastic, it just starts to go, and the next thing you know, you've got a sail or um, a giant balloon if you happen to grab onto that plastic, and you might go with it. So, <laughs> and, and on that point, um, if there's a storm coming up, they get closed. We don't ever go through a storm with them open every every tunnel is closed tight and so it's a challenge because you know the storms come in and it's still 70 80 90 degrees and you you know 
you're out there in the rain sometimes getting them closed up because you you don't want to bake them mm -hmm. um, and then as soon as that storm is gone then then you open them back up so for Peggy, what's your advice? Having a high tunnel is like having a, a what? <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, we have a lot of people that come and look. NRCS is constantly referring people. Um, you go talk to Peggy if you want one of these. But I always say, if you're not fond of two-year-old children, don't get a high tunnel because they're that high maintenance. They really, yeah. really are. You're not, you're not going to have a high tunnel and have a, a farm job. Somebody is always at our place 24-7. Yep. Yep. So that's something for those of you who have high tunnels, you can probably relate. Or if you're thinking about getting a high tunnel, having a plan in place to manage it for weather events and especially manage it so it doesn't overheat is really important. And that's a great promotion. We are hoping to have a high tunnel short course West River. Um, exact location to be determined, but it should be Rapid City in late October or early November. So um, for those of you who are listening from across South Dakota or feel that you're driving distance to Rapid City, um, stay tuned for details on that short course because we'd love to nerd out about high tunnels with you even more. So as we're wrapping up, um, Kent, lots of people are really interested in that cover crop seed mix. Are you comfortable sharing? Do you have a website or a contact information that they could reach out to you? Yep, um, I will share my screen. I think I had it in the last slide that I maybe didn't get to here. But yeah, I will um, certainly have, when I get my contact information up here. <clears throat> Actually, this is the form, if you can all see that, that we use when it's an NRCS form. And I just use this here to basically give my, um, calculate my pounds of seed that I might need. So for example, the, the only drawback with this is really the, the one acre is the smallest amount that you can use. So this is an example of the cover crop form. Um, it's more for our traditional or conventional type agriculture. Um, producers that it can be used also and it, it might give you some ideas for cover crop mixes you'll find a lot of the common cover crop species on here um, so i can certainly share that and then yep there is my contact information just my first name dot last name at usda.gov um, i can certainly take any emails um, i also promote that we have um we have an urban conservationist that just came on staff with us here about six months ago, uh, Rachel Fry. Um, she'll have a lot of information for you also um, in, in kind of this realm that we're talking about with uh, specialty crop production and smaller scale production. Awesome. And Peggy, where might people be able to look? Um, you know, do you have a farm Facebook page or places they should look for you or follow you on social media to keep up with what's going on at Cedar Creek Gardens? Yep. Um, we have a, a Facebook page. It's just facebook.com slash Cedar Creek Gardens, or you can go to C Cedar Creek Gardens cedarcreekgarden.com. But the best place is either Facebook or Instagram. And um, you guys are always, you know, welcome to come on down if you think you want to get into that high tunnel thing because um, it's a different ball game. Um, I'm, I'm glad that we have them. Uh, you know, like I say, we grow um, April through November and they're worth it, but I'm not going to say they're not challenging. And I do want to give a shameless plug, Christine, to our conference that we're going to be having. So um, I sit on the board of South Dakota Specialty Producers, and we have a collaborative agreement with NRCS, and we will be having a conference in March. Um, and this is going to be a technical conference. There's going to be um, one track that is on growing. There's going to be one on soil health, and there's going to be one on building infrastructure. And these, um, this conference will align with the equip practices. So it's how... Um, you can, you know, use NRCS equipment practices to help get some cost share for some things. So it'll be in that it's going to be, I believe it's the 21st and 22nd. It's going to be in, in conjunction with our, our annual meeting for um, specialty producers. And that's another resource too, you guys, that if you're, um, you know, looking to help move your specialty crops, make sure you reach out to the specialty producers because we have aggregation meetings going on right now, four of them clear across the state, um, just trying to figure out how we can help all of the um, 
growers across the state. And and we and we do help the you know the beef producers and egg producers and too. So awesome. Thank you for promoting those. And Peggy, I'm glad you brought up Equip. Can can you touch very briefly on funding opportunities through the NRCS for folks who are in South Dakota? Yeah, I will be very brief. I don't work a lot with our programs anymore, not with my current position, but we do have um, if any of you have experience with the NRCS, especially in South Dakota from prior years, many years ago, we didn't. Uh, to be quite frank, we didn't have a lot of opportunity for, for smaller scale producers or for our um, specialty crop producers. Um, just a lot of what we were working with didn't have, it wasn't scalable down to, to some of the sizes that are, are worked on our specialty crops. Um, but we're a lot better now. We can do a lot of different irrigation, like micro irrigation. We're starting to work on some of that stuff. Um, we do um, a lot of our traditional management practices, like uh, say, for example, pest management or nutrient management. Um, we can help cost share and help offset some of the uh, some of the costs that you might have, especially if you're just learning how to do that. Um, we can do um, we can do a lot more with high tunnels and cat tunnels than we than we could before. Um, and to be honest, Peggy's been a good source. That's why I didn't talk too much with the high tunnel and the construction. I, I most of what I've learned has been from Peggy and people like her. So. Um, yeah, we do have better resources um, now too. Like I said, we have a you know, we call it the urban conservationist, but um, she'll work a lot with um, specialty crop producers as well. Um, we do have we do have better programs now that are better. We're able to fit a lot of our specialty crop producers. So I would, yeah, we have a field office in every county, um, and they can certainly help you go through that sign up and, and application process. Wonderful, Peggy. Anything else you want to add about that? Yep, Rachel Fry is the Urban Ag Innovation Technology Specialist that NRC has hired. And so Rachel's a great source of information. Um, also, they do have two new practices. So even though you may be just a backyard gardener, they have a, one, a new practice for um, raised beds and they also have one for low tunnels. So, the, and, and they, they're, they're still working on some of the standards, but next year those practices will be available and there are lots of practices that um again as Kent said you know it's not just all about building soil there's practices for nutrient management irrigation um just lots of them that could be applicable to anybody mm -hmm. so i think that's a great um take home message um thank you both for sharing your knowledge with you know managing soil health interpreting those soil test results and understanding what that means in a production setting, Peggy. And thanks for closing out with some ways that folks can find more resources and especially that funding element. So uh, again, on behalf of SDSU Extension, um, thank you to both of you for presenting tonight. And for everyone on the call, thank you once again for filling out that brief survey about tonight's session. And a reminder that we have our fourth and final session on Thursday night. Same time, same Zoom link, and myself and Dr. Rhoda Burrows are going to be talking about some of the, we'll call them challenges and opportunities that we uncovered during year one of our clover cover crop trials um, that were held in Brookings, Beersford, and at Peggy's Farm. So if you want to hear more about Peggy's Farm, please tune in on Thursday night and we'll talk about some of the lessons we learned with integrating cover crops. So again, thank you everyone. Have a great evening and we look forward to seeing you for our final session on Thursday night. Mm -hmm.